Anyway, Dennis always delivers a great lecture, so please welcome Dennis Perkala. Thank you. Was this well done of your lady? Extremely well. As befitting. Last of so many noble. Rulers. And the Roman asked, Was this well done of your lady? And the servant answered, Extremely well, as befitting the last of so many noble rulers. That scene, the very ending of the movie Cleopatra, is described perfectly in Plutarch's Lives, The Life of Antony. Copied exactly for the movie. It's also the ending scene used by Shakespeare for Antony and Cleopatra. He used Plutarch for his uh, sources on uh, Julius Caesar and Antony and Cleopatra. The last of so many rulers. I personally find that this is an era skipped over. It's skipped over in the, most history books. It's skipped over by a lot of people. 300 years of rule, yet the history books go ancient Middle East, Greeks, Ro Alexander the Great, and then the Romans. Something happened in between the Hellenistic era, which we're going to talk about, and as it applied to Egypt, was the Tol Ptolemies, one of the in fact, it was the longest Egyptian dynasty. All of the rulers, all the kings, were named Ptolemy. One through Cleopatra's son was 15. The Egyptians actually didn't, name, didn't number them. That's a modern convenience. They used the nicknames that they either adopted themselves or the people attached to them. <laughs> we'll cover these not in excruciating detail. We'll talk about the beginning of the uh, reign, what Egyptian culture and Greek culture overlaid on top of it, not intermingled, was like during this period, and then we'll get into the Semi side of the Ptolemies, where they were basically trying to kill the dynasty off themselves and did not succeed. And then we'll finish with talking about Cleopatra and then some of her influences in particular, her legacies. The story starts in 323 BC. Alexander is dead. He's in Babylon and his generals are around him. Now what the heck do we do? Well, we won't go into detail on all the conferences, but one of his generals, Ptolemy, one of his companions, grew up with him, uh, educated by Aristotle, like him, part of that coterie of uh, boys that grew up together. He says, I'll take Egypt and heads there immediately, before, before the conferences even really break up. He remembered Egypt well from when the army was there, conquering it from the Persian Empire, and he saw its potential, wealthy and easy to defend. In addition, Alexander had already started uh, training an army there. So, and there was a serious war chest, 8,000 talents. Modern money, that's about $5 billion, but let's just say equate it to billions, period. Okay? Uh, that's a lot of money. Okay, that keeps a lot of soldiers in the field, that pays for a lot of slaves, that pays for ships, that pays for whatever you need to do to run a government. When the empire broke up initially, this calls them kingdoms. It took a, uh, took 
quite a few years. It was in 305 B.C., 304 B.C., where they started declaring themselves kings after the, uh, Alexander's son, who was born after he died, uh, and his brother, were, were, uh, who were co-kings, died, um, or were killed, to be more exact. Uh, those are the major kingdoms that the, the successor states, the Adokai in Greek, Seleucus, Antigonus, Ptolemy, Lysimachus, and Cassander. Then a whole bunch of little states around the edge. Later on, these four ganged up on Antigonus and in one of the most massive battles in antiquity, over 100,000 soldiers on each side, um, almost 200 elephants, tens of thousands of cavalry, big battle here in Ipsus, uh, defeated them and then carved it up with Seleucus getting most of this, Lysimachus getting some, and Ptolemy getting nothing because he didn't play. And uh, he, he was slow taking these cities and that's all he got. So they got Syria, uh, part of Syria, but they didn't give it to him outright. So Seleucus and the Ptolemies managed to fight over it for decades to come. Ptolemy was an interesting character already. His first mistress, Thais, had already hit history. She's the one that convinced Alexander in the big party in the Persian capital, Persepolis, where everybody got drunk, let's take torches and burn the place down. And she led Alexander and the rest of the party out and threw the, the firebrands into the palace and burned the whole place down. So when you see the ruins of Persepolis, thank Ptolemy's girlfriend. He was forced, uh, along with many generals, he had a Persian wife, dumped her, took Thais to uh, um, Egypt with him, apparently, and then she disappears from the history records. He married Eurydice, and then put her aside and married Berenike. The, um, interestingly, though, uh, he kept, kept his uh, children from the first marriage, and Ptolemy II came out of that. Number of children, three of them kings. Ptolemy Karanos starting to show the abilities of the uh, Ptolemaic family. He was actually older than Ptolemy II. Um, was kind of kicked out because of his behavior. He went off to go live with uh, the other kings, Seleucus and uh, um, Lysimachus. And when Seleucus finally defeated Lysimachus, when they're both old men, years later, Ptolemy Karanus stabs Seleucus in the back and tries to inherit both kingdoms at once. And succeeded only in getting the kingdom of Macedonia, interestingly enough, and went off, was killed by a Gaelic invasion. Gauls got all the way down into Greece and Turkey and uh, about 279. BC, and he was succeeded by his other brother, Meliager, who was then killed the next year by Gauls. They had a, a good time with the Ptolemies. Anyway, Ptolemy II inherited the throne and moved on. I love to point out the coins. Coins played an important part in Greek history. They were symbols of authority. The diadem was actually the, this little band around the hair was the equivalent of a crown in ancient Greece. So that's how, how they identified the kings. The symbols were important, the face, and all the Ptolemies had the eagle on the, on the backside. One of the ways Ptolemy I established his um, legitimacy, such as it was, when Alexander had been mummified, not in the Egyptian way, but kind of with honey and uh, um, kept in a preserved state and was being taken back to Macedonia to be buried with the rest of the Macedonian kings. Ptolemy sent a group of cavalry to hijack it and brought it to Egypt and said, look, I've got Alexander's body, therefore I'm the legitimate successor. Set himself up. Temporarily, Alexandria was still under construction. It had started to be constructed when Alexander uh, went through Egypt. 
and, and founded it, named it after himself, the little egotist. And, but it wasn't ready yet to house major parts of the government, so Ptolemy had Memphis as his capital. This is a fairly recent, I think it's 2005, find in Memphis a number of Greek statues near a temple. And the current thinking, no evidence, but the thinking is that this was where Alexander's body was laying, his tomb, until later on when it moved to Alexandria. Don't know that for a fact, but good supposition. Ptolemy II started the fashion in ancient Egypt, in, uh, uh, excuse me, in the Ptolemaic regime, decided to borrow from the pharaohs and married his full sister. First he married Ashenoe I, the daughter of Lysimachus, as I mentioned, one of the other successors. Then he repudiated her to marry his sister. She was not only his full sister, she was also his stepmother-in-law. She was the widow of Lysimachus. So things are already getting complicated in the family tree. The reunions must have been a blast. <laughs> Interesting things that happened during his reign, uh, the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint, the uh, Jew Jewish scriptures were translated in Alexandria into Greek. Arsinoe, one of the reasons why she left out, uh, Lysimachus, well, he died, but also then Ptolemy Kiranos, her half-brother, killed her children and took her for wife. She fled, went away to Egypt, and that's where her brother took her in, even though she was also eight years older. She is the first woman on Egyptian coins. Um, there are, and this was part of the propaganda, we're going to be Zeus, Hera, brother, sister, gods, lovers, husband and wife. So Zeus and Hera, and oh by the way, there's a pharaonic connection, and he was also the first of the Ptolemies to be crowned as Pharaoh. Ptolemy the first took the title of Pharaoh, but Ptolemy the second took the title of, uh, uh, was actually crowned in Memphis as Egyptian pharaohs are supposed to be. Also under him, the empire reached its height. Alexander was starting to be built out. Already luxury was starting to become the norm. The wealth of Egypt was showing itself. They were growing lots of grain as normal, selling this abroad, working w across the, um, the Mediterranean. There was a story of a parade when Ptolemy II uh, was ruling in down the Canopic Way, I'll show you pictures of that later, of the main thoroughfare in Alexandria, which featured a wineskin made of leopard pelts that was so big it held 300,000 gallons of wine. There was a silver lance, 90 feet long. There was a golden phallus, 180 feet long and 9 feet in diameter. The uh, this was a symbol of the era, and this is across the Hellenistic region, the Middle East, Greece, Egypt, gargantuanness. There was no such thing as bad taste. If you could build something, build it bigger, build it better, build it gaudier, build big. The wealth of the Persian Empire was now the wealth of the, the uh, um, successor kings and they put it to use. A lot of military use, I'll show you that, a lot of building, and a lot of just extravagance. Oh, I mentioned also he built Pharaoh's lighthouse was up there as a bullet, I'll show you that in a minute too. Ptolemy III, 246 to 221 BC, he was the son of uh, the first wife, Arsinoe I, not the second wife, the full sister. He married outside the family, which was a rarity. He married a Seleucid princess from Syria, still Greek. And he also uh, had to put up with one of the first um, rebellions of the Egyptians. So there were periodic rebellions throughout the Ptolemaic regime. He started the wars with uh, the Seleucids in particular, fought wars with Macedonia. They always kept an interest in the Aegean, so they're fighting all across the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, tried to keep them separate, but think of a three-way war, big tug of war. 
He got all the way to Babylon. Antioch, one source says he even got to India. Don't trust that one. But he did have a lot of boundary movements up and down the, the Syrian coastline, Palestine, etc. And again, the eagle, always there. How big was the empire? As I said, he got Palestine in the uh, remnants of Antigonus's empire, not much more. Kept fighting over this coast, multiple wars. Last year, Professor Nijhaun did a, a presentation on, talked about those wars quite a bit, so I won't go into detail. Egypt, Cyrenica, and because they built the navy up quite a bit, and the Ptolemaic navy dominated the eastern Mediterranean, they were able to capture the coastline. Cyprus, most of Asia Minor, and in fact, this just shows that one period. In other periods, they reached much further inland. And up here, and notice there's even green up here, the uh, Bosphorus. Or excuse, and uh, the Hellespont, excuse me. So they were um, capturing large chunks. There's also periods where they held Crete and large chunks of the islands. That was brought them into conflict with Macedonia. As always, this is the Seleucid Empire. They're fighting with them. They did have two main allies. Started early. Uh, one was Athens. They sent fleets to help protect Athens during some of the wars. Rhodes, Ptolemy the first title. His nickname was Soter. It was given to him by the Rhodians. It means savior. He came to help them during one of the pitched battles uh, when they were being attacked. And one other important ally came early, back in the 200s. Sent an embassy and said, hey, let's be friends. Sure, why not? The Carthaginians are our enemy too. Rome. They had always ongoing friendship with Rome. That alliance went way back. Talk about Alexandria for a minute. This is a map. It says time of Cleopatra, but there's a Byzantine wall and some moss thrown in here too. But important points, okay, city wall out here, Lake Mariatus. The Pharos the lighthouse was out here. This is the Great Harbor. This is more commercial harbor, more naval over here. Um, the Agora, the, the, the shopping center. The gymnasium is over here. Main quarters, the Delta Quarter, which later on became largely Jewish, as Jewish immigrants from also they were fighting wars uh, against the Syrians. Lots came down here. In fact, at, for major chunks of its time, the, the Jewish component was a, uh, not a necessarily a majority of the population, but a significant uh, minority. The Bruchion, the royal quarter, where the palaces were. We'll talk about the Timonium. Uh, it's on the other map. Well, there it is right there. It's little tiny house built by Mark Antony later on. Uh, the Serapeum, big temple up on a hill. There's Diocletian's tower, uh, the pillar, pillar of Diocletian, which if you've been to Alexandria, you may have seen. Harbors for the lakeside, big harbors, and the causeway to go at the pharaohs. Egyptian quarter, Rekatis, which is the area was originally there. It was an Egyptian fishing village. When Alexander decided to put a big city here, they incorporated it. So that became the Egyptian quarter. The moon gate, the sun gate, uh, canopic gate, excuse me, and the canopic way we talked about. Slightly different way of showing the map. A little more, clears things up a little bit. This is Arian. Oh, one piece that was on the other map, the Soma, which was where Alexander's tomb eventually went and was the major tourist attraction in Alexandria, was somewhere in this area, in Beta. But we don't know where. Nobody's ever found his tomb. It kind of disappears from history, and nobody knows what happened to it. There have been major uh, searches for it. There's been evidence it was underneath one of the churches, but nobody can find it. The museum was up in this area, up in the uh, palace district, the Bruchion. There's the Timonium I talked about. 
Oh, let me go back for a second. This area here is all underwater now. That's that area that fell into the sea and later earthquakes. And now they're diving on to try and find the remnants and the statues of the area. So most of the palace complex is underwater. Beautiful city. Alexandria had between 400,000 and 500,000 residents. It was larger than Rome, although Rome later on and during the empire achieved about a million. But for a long time, this was the largest city in the Western world. 60 meters wide, the Canopic Way. Arcades lining it with shops all the way up and down. Fancy homes right off it at the palace complexes off to the right over here. Serapeum over here. You can see the causeway to Pharaohs. Gorgeous city. Imagine the parades going up and down. Caravans coming in. By the early 1800s, when the British came in to take it from the Turks, well, the French, actually, the, those that he left behind and abandoned, all that was left was two little villages clustered among the, the ruins. Pharaoh's Lighthouse was ordered, built by Ptolemy I, completed by the second. Major technological effort, beautiful, could be seen, the light from this could be seen with mirrors, could be seen 29 miles out to sea, guided ships in the harbor. Lucian has a story that Sostratus, the architect, wanted to put his name on it and Ptolemy said, no, we put my name on it. Okay, fine. He put his name chiseled, Sostratus put his own name chiseled into the stone. Put plaster over it and put Ptolemy's name. What happens to plaster? It wears away. Decades later, it's Sostratus's, not Ptolemy's lighthouse. Destroyed by an earthquake in the 1200s. Um, now you can go and see where it was. Some of the foundation is left. There's a Chinese copy if you want to see a life-size version. The museum, founded by Ptolemy II, uh, idea of gathering together um, scholars from across the Greek world, kind of originated with Ptolemy I, but the second put it into place, built the museum. 14,000 scholars worked here at a time, all paid for by the government, their upkeep. Nothing but the best. It was um, a way, just go and think, think good thoughts, do good things. And the advances that they did was amazing. You're still living with some of them. They cataloged, uh, by the time Cleopatra came in, they got about a hundred about a million books, hundred, a million books uh, they got. One of the ways, two ways, interestingly, um, Ptolemy number one saw libraries in Athens and said, ooh, I need those. Okay, you can borrow and make copies. Give us a large surety, cash, that you will, a bond that you'll forfeit if uh, anything happens to the books. You got it. Gave them the cash decided he wanted to keep the books, gave them the copies back, and said, keep the money. That was the, one of the foundations of the library. The other foundation, the way they built up the library, any ship or caravan that came into Alexandria got searched. All books got turned over to the library. They made copies. They gave the copies to the, the ship or the caravan or whoever came in. The original stayed in the library. Things they did, we talked in previous lectures about er Eratosthenes. Um, he actually fairly accurately calculated the circumference of the Earth. Euclid's geometry, everybody here has probably had to deal with them in, in school at some point. Okay? Um, astronomy, the, the idea of the sun being the center of the solar system. Star catalogs that we're still working with today. Um, medicine. Manetho, the person that came up with the whole system of pharaohs and dynasties as we number them. Manetho's list, he developed that while he was in the, the library. 
Uh, Library of Science developed Callimachus, who put together a way to catalog these hundreds of thousands of books. There was a daughter library at the Serapeum. Think of it as a, a branch. Uh, and a warehouse where they stored them as well. Sosigenes, the Julian calendar, Jim Laudermilk's previous lecture. Um, he's the one that gave the calendar to Julius Caesar. It said here, this is better than what you're using in Rome. And that was the basis of the Julian calendar, which through the Gregorian calendar that we use today is pretty much still in use because that's really just a slight modification. So if you looked at a calendar or know that today is October 17th, you're affected by that library today. And Archimedes' screw, which we don't know. That's a legend. There's no evidence of that, no historic scholar who says that. But supposedly Archimedes was visiting the library and said, hey, you need some way to efficiently move water up, and invented the screw. That's the legend. We don't have the evidence for it. And the modern library at Alexandria. The Egyptians have rebuilt it. It is up to, I, from what I read, about 4 million books now, all languages. I would love to go there. I have not been there. Last time I was in Alexandria was 1977 on a Greek destroyer. It was slightly different then. The economy. This was the wealthiest nation in the ancient Mediterranean by far. Not only did they have the, the gold from uh, eastern Egypt and Cyprus, they had copper, they grew grain, lots of grain. They went on elephant hunts for their army down, to, uh, down the Red Sea and down the African coast. They had, this was the opening of the spice trade with India. The, the Ptolemies were the ones, not the, for them personally, but their sailors were the ones that discovered the monsoon seasons and the rotation and figured out how to get across the Indian Ocean to India and opened up the spice trade with southern India. Caravan trade with Asia. Gaza was one of the main ending points for caravans coming across the Middle East. Wealth, wealth and more wealth. They had probably twice the income that Rome ever had uh, while Rome was still a republic. Before they went on a tear and basically decided to conquer everything, the Romans that is. In religion, Ptolemy the Soter attempted to unify Greek and Egyptian religion by creating a new god. Let's take Apis instead of Amun that Alexander was trying to use, merge it with Osiris, Osiris Apis, Serapis. That's where he came from. Build the, the Serapeum in Alexandria. There are Serapeums all across the Mediterranean. I've seen one in Naples. They're gorgeous. I saw the foundations of one in Naples. They've been knocked down thanks to many centuries of people not liking paganism. But other than that, they pretty much stayed separate, kept the rest of the religion separate. They kept the rest of the society separate. They built Greek foundations across the Middle East. Excuse me, across Egypt. These were the Greek cities, Macedonian cities. This is where the settlers were put. Alexandria had, as I said, about half a million population, but the other cities were much smaller. Memphis had maybe 50,000. The rest were smaller. So most of the population of about Five to seven million were living in the rural areas, as they always have in Egypt. But this is the, the locations. Berenike, the major port, which is still in operation, was that uh, departure point for the trips down the African coast or over to India. Pelusium was the gateway to Egypt. They built a large fortress there. The Cyrenica, Benghazi was one of their foundations. And interestingly, one of the places that they brought into production, and we'll talk about how they do that, the Fayum they brought, which was already in production, but had kind of during Persian times, fallen on bad times, lost cultivation, cultivable area. They brought it back in and doubled the size. So that areas that are today desert and where we're going out and finding papyrus and mummies and things like that were at the time lovely vineyards, Brain growing areas.
little archaeology. This is the stele of, at Alexandria of uh, Philoxenos. This is a reconstruction of it, modern time. This is what it would look like, what we think he, he would have looked like in real life, running around. This is a, a member of the Palace Guard Cavalry. The elite of the elite. Who manned this? The children of the nobility, the younger, the sons, okay? Came to town and stayed around the king. This is a recreation of actually another stele. The army was brought in and they encouraged settlement. If you're Greek, if you're Macedonian, come here, I need you for the army. We have lots of kids. It was actually illegal to marry between the, the nationalities, Greek and Egyptian. In Alexandria, that law held. In the countryside, not so much. But the Greeks' attitude was that anybody that got a Greek education was Greek. Therefore, Egyptians became Greek because they got the education. There's actually a story of a village clerk, who um, Minich, that uh, he became, he titled himself a Greek born in this country. He was actually Egyptian, but had learned Greek, became a uh, Greek educated, and moved on. The Clerichis, this is the land allotments given to the military settlers. If you were in the cavalry, you got a lot. If you're an officer, you got even more. If you're in the infantry, you got less, but you got a form to take care of. This was so important that on, in the Hellenistic era, for all the other kingdoms, most of the armies were largely mercenary. If you'd lost in a battle and you had to surrender, fine, you went over to the other army and, okay, fine, I'm in your army now. Egyptian troops were noted for if they got captured, they'd say, fine, we're your prisoners. At the end of the war, turn us back over and run back to Egypt. They stayed Egyptian because they had land holdings, families. Some of them became absentee landlords, particularly as they moved further and further um, into the military, became more, more engaged in military operations. But Egyptians later on got included. The infantry, the phalanx. If you saw the movie Alexander, there was a wonderful example of it, how they fought. They get, got rid of the eight-foot spears. This is an innovation of Alexander's father, Philip II. They took 18-foot spears called cerises. They went shield to shield, shoulder to shoulder. This is a syntagma, 16 by 16, so 256 men. And they basically marched forward in a hedgehog. It was almost impenetrable. That's only 256. Imagine 20,000 or 40,000 of these men coming at you at once, all lined up this way. And that was quite an impenetrable um, force. However, what would you oppose it with? Your own phalanx. And so they got out there and shoved each other and push a, a, a pike. The spears of the rear rows were held up at an angle because that meant that enemy troops hitting them with arrows or javelins, that would help deflect them. One of the Roman generals that came up against the phalanx in, in Greece when they were first fighting in Greece said this was the most terrifying thing he ever saw on the battlefield. As I said, they went on elephant hunts because they needed elephants to be their tanks, to trample the troops, couldn't break into the front, but if you got into the side of a phalanx, you could wreak havoc. Unfortunately, African elephants are smaller than Asian elephants, so they were fighting at a slight disadvantage. They used lots of light troops to protect the sides of the phalanx. Here's a parade much later in Alexandria, Gallic auxiliaries, Native Egyptians, Nubians, and their regular uh, uh, cavalry. This is from uh, the Palestrina, a larger mosaic showing Nile scenes, showing a bunch of troops. It's in Italy now. It's in the Prenesti Museum. I need to go back and show you some stuff because I, I forgot to talk about their cloaks to show you how elite these people were and how wealthy. If you looked at that cloak, you'd say it's yellow. The way they got yellow dye in ancient Egypt was by using saffron. 
it took 20,000 blossoms to make a kilogram of saffron. As if the, those of you that have been in a grocery store might know that the spice aisle is the most expensive. Saffron is the most expensive. You get it 14 bucks for a little twig. Imagine what it would take to dye a whole regiment of cloaks. Okay. But that's the second most expensive dye. The most expensive is the purple border, Murex. Okay, the, the royal purple from the, um, the, the shells, shellfish. Venetian purple. The fleet, as a retired Navy officer, this is my favorite part, but the, uh, again, gargantuanness was the name of the day. Across the top here, they're trying to show the different arrangements of rowers. And ships were named, like we have destroyers, cruisers, battleships, aircraft carriers. They had threes, fours, five, sixes. That meant how many rowers were in a bank of oars? If there was, typically there were three oars, could be two, but there have been a lot of scholarly arguments because we don't know for sure exactly how they arranged it. If it were, if it was a six, was that three and three, or was that two, two, and two? So it's a question of how many people were on the side of the ship manning the oars. But they kept building, as I said, bigger and bigger and bigger. They had tens were typically flagships, 15s, 11s, 12s, 20s, 30s. And the Ptolemies had to outdo them all. Ptolemy IV built a 40. It took 4,000 rowers, could hold about 3,000 marines. It was a catamaran. We, this is, we don't know for sure. We think, this is historical analysis, the only way it would work would be to build a catamaran, build two massive ships, and put a platform in between them for catapults and large crossbows. At the Battle of Salamis, shown here, Ptolemy I had 200 galleys, large galleys, 100 transports carrying his troops. He lost. He got away with 20 ships. That's the scale of the fleets that were being produced at that time. These are triremes, threes, small ships. That's actually a photograph that's been photoshopped to show a fleet. There's one, the Olympia, and that's the one they have in Athens that they built to, to, to try and figure out how these things were done. And they have a bunch of students out there rowing these things. And they found that one of the things is they're awfully close packed and it's very uncomfortable. And if anybody smells, it gets awkward. Ptolemy IV. When he ascended the throne, he promptly murdered his brothers and sisters. Now we're seeing a trend in the family. He, start, he did one great thing, Battle of Raphia, he won against the Ptolemies. Raphia, and I'll show you a the, the little bit more about the battle. Raphia is now the modern Rafa, right at the Egyptian Gaza Strip border. This is where all the crossing, illegal crossing, tunneling is going on between Egypt and uh, the Strip. But native revolt happened for 20 years. We'll talk about that in a bit. He was not a great administrator. He did come out of his lethargy to win that battle. At the end of his reign, both he and his queen were killed by his mistress. I mentioned Raphia right here. What happened was Antiochus III, the Great, he conquered all the way to India, reconquered big chunks of Iran, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, etc. Got decided to go into Egypt, started taking, this is the first uh, time that Egypt lost Palestine and never regained it, but he took all these places while he was doing that. Um, they trained an army up, and this was the first time native Egyptians were trained to be in the phalanx, doubled the size of the phalanx. That worked for the battle, it later proved to be a mistake. But they fought a big battle over here, the Battle of Raphia, and Ptolemy IV wins. They used war elephants, both sides. I love war elephants. It's the tanks of the day. Phalanx, phalanx, 
light troops, cavalry, cavalry, elephants, elephants. And both sides right attack. Ptolemy starts on the left, which is odd because kings usually started on the right. It's a place of honor in the ancient days. Antiochus is on his right, and this is the Seleucid forces. He attacks, and he quickly wins. This is phase two of the battle. He wins, but Ptolemy escapes, gets over, joins the phalanx, and defeats the phalanx, while his right was winning over on the other side. So he wins. Antiochus, who defeats the Egyptian left, comes charging back from the battle, realizes he's lost, and just escapes with his cavalry. The size of the battle was massive. 6,000 horses, 47 horses, 68,000 troops, 56,000 troops, different size, light troops, peltas, 73 elephants versus 102. I didn't think much of elephants in warfare when I was younger. And then when I was about 35, I went to the Ringling Brothers Circus. And they charged the elephants out all at once, led by Big Tusker, who was this massive Af uh, Asian elephant. And these five elephants just come charging down, and I was near the front row. And I realized that this massive mound of gray flesh would scare to hell out of any troops that had to face it when they come running at you. If you had 18-foot services out in front of you and lots of them, it might be, feel good. But if you were in the cavalry, ca horses are scared to death of elephants. They won't go near them. So cavalry, in fact, elephants were frequently used as a screen to keep the cavalry away. So... Um, this was really something, quite a battle. That is one of the largest elephant battles in history, after Ipsus. So Ptolemy dies, killed by his mistress. Ptolemy V, God manifests himself. He has to, to suppress the revolt. Why was there a revolt? Because there were Egyptians in the phalanx. And they went back home and said, hey, we helped you win the battle. We want a piece of the government now. We get a say around here. No, you don't. You're Egyptian. Get back down in your place. And they revolt. 20 years it took at times. And in fact, I didn't know this, that became the 35th dynasty in some counting. There were two pharaohs in Thebes. They ruled in Upper Egypt and at, got 80% of Egypt at, at some points. Eventually, Ptolemy V puts it down, kills the last one. Talks him into surrendering and then executes him immediately. Ptolemy V's other accomplishment when he first got the throne, his accession speech, not speech, but uh, document was the Rosetta Stone. It was a document in three languages setting up the cult. It was by his administrators. From here, I'm going to go real fast because the, the family tree gets complicated and ugly. Ptolemy VI. When Ptolemy V died, Ptolemy VI and his sister were only five years old. They were married. The court took over. However, they liked to kill each other, as they had when Ptolemy V, who was also a child when he took over. Ministers were fighting like crazy. So you have now two generations of kings that are children when they take the throne. The army has deteriorated. It's no longer strong. This is uh, um, 50, 60 years later. And so what do we do? We, we get invaded. Antiochus IV invades from Syria in 168 BC. Uh, the, the Romans decide to send help. They send an embassy led by a senator. The senator Caius Papilius Lyanus, he intervenes, goes up to Antiochus IV uh, just outside Alexandria. Antiochus was totally intent on adding Egypt to his kingdom. He wanted to be the king of Syria and Egypt. And it was such a weak country at the time because of the disarray in the government. He thought he had it. The Romans intervened. Remember the long-term alliance. Caius Papilius steps forward to meet the king. The king puts out his hand to shake it. Papilius puts in a list of demands and says, you have to meet our demands immediately, which is mainly leave. He said, oh, I have to talk to my advisors and think about it at which point the senator took his staff and drew a line in the circle around him in the sand. He said, I'll have your answer before you leave that circle. And the king thought for a good few minutes, and then he agreed and left. One senator and his family made big propaganda of this for decades. 
but one senator turned around an army that was about to conquer Egypt. What most history books don't tell you, you have to really dig, is that Antiochus IV, when he was a prince, had been a hostage in Rome. He knew the senators, he knew the power, he knew what was behind it, he knew about the Roman armies. He didn't want to tangle with Rome at the time. So he turned around and went home. Saved Egypt's independence for, the, for a while, but Egypt was now reduced. It only owned Egypt, Cyprus, and Cyrenica, that part of, uh, of Egypt, of um, Libya. I'm not done with all the violence. That's the Ptolemy the sixth, Ptolemy the eighth. Now things get complicated and people have multiple reign periods because they're trading thrones, they're killing each other, they're going into exile and then they're coming back. Ptolemy the eighth had three periods of rule, 170 to 163 where he was co-ruler with Ptolemy the sixth. 145 to 131 and 127 to 116. What was he doing in between those periods? He was off ruling in Cyrenaica or Cyprus. Um, he kicked, got kicked off the throne a uh, number twice because he was cruel and he raised taxes, probably more the latter. Um, Ptolemy the sixth, he actually got uh, booted, he booted his dad out basically uh, stepdad, excuse me, and so he um, I'm sorry, brother, he booted his brother out and uh, I see, I'm having trouble keeping this straight, he booted his brother out and so his brother went to Rome, got Roman support and came back and so now he's gone, he's off in Cyprus and so they're bouncing back and forth. When Ptolemy VI died, he came back, took the throne, married Cleopatra III. Ptolemy VI's daughter, excuse me, Ptolemy, Cleopatra II, married his, his wife. Who was also his sister-in-law and sister. Married her murdered her son by her previous husband, his nephew, and then, and that was Ptolemy VII, so at the wedding, uh, either at the wedding or soon thereafter when she was pregnant and he knew he had an heir, she then plotted against him. So he didn't do anything against her, he then chopped Ptolemy the seventh up into uh, little pieces and gave it to her, gave it to her in a box. Here's your son. Thank you very much. Three years later he raped his daughter, who was also his niece and stepdaughter at the same time, or raped her daughter, excuse me, and took her, that was his niece and stepdaughter, took her as his wife. And now he had two wives, so Cleopatra the second and Cleopatra the third simultaneously, so they, um, they, they were pol polygamous and they hated each other, the mother and daughter, and so Cleopatra III had Cleopatra II killed. During this period, to find out what the heck is going on, a Roman embassy came. What is going on here? And Ptolemy VIII, remember the fatty in the chart? This is fatty, Fizcon. He went down to meet him in the port wearing a diaphanous gown, and he was quite obese, fatty, and the Romans said, let's walk back to the palace, and they said, afterwards they said, we gave the Alexandrians a treat, they got to see their king take a walk, which was rare, but they also said, it was pretty disgusting, we saw things we shouldn't be seeing. He, Ptolemy VIII also instituted a form of an obscene dance, which later on nobody, uh, uh, we don't have the details on, but later on we'll run into some under later Cleopatra uh, that may have been related called the fish dance. Ptolemy IX, he got to the throne, uh, Cleopatra III favored instead the tenth over here, his brother, and so Look at what they're doing. They're swapping sisters here, wives. I mean, it's, it's ugly. You don't want to know all the details. Rome lent 
Ptolemy the 10th money. Why is Rome a not as rich country lending money to Egypt? They have so disassembled the empire now and uh, gotten it bad. That, uh, and then who is he fighting? His brother. When Ptolemy the Ninth died, Berenike ruled for six months. She's not even on, oh, down here. And she was pretty popular. She did pretty, pretty good. Then uh, Ptolemy XI, another Roman client, came in, married her, and had her killed 19 days later. That wasn't a good idea. She was popular. She was well liked. The Alexandrian crowd rioted and tore him to pieces when he was in the gymnasium. Ptolemy XI had no legitimate children, so now we're looking around. Where's the little bastards from the concubines? And found Ptolemy the Twelfth. And that's Cleopatra's dad. They they were um, his reign started in 81 BC with his sister. He was violent and had high taxes, so the Alexandrians drove him out too. He bribed the Romans for support significantly. 6,000 talents to Caesar just to speak well of him in the Senate. 10,000 talents to Gabinius, the governor of Syria, to bring his army down and restore him to power, which he did. And then the Romans left two legions down there, about 10,000 men, in order to uh, um, keep him in power. It took Roman support. He's now a client king, a puppet king, if you will. And so now we get to Cleopatra, who is one of his daughters, along with Arsinoe, we'll talk about her, Ptolemy the 13th and Ptolemy the 14th, both of whom at different times Cleopatra was married to. Was she beautiful? Historical record actually says she was plain. However, there's, this is a fairly well-attested bust of her because of the diadem, her Egyptian statue, picture of her later with her son and co-ruler. Some people look at these coins and say, no, nah, she's not beautiful. Doesn't matter. She was beautiful because she was the ruler of the richest country in the world. She's beautiful. But she also had charm and intelligence. Everybody that came in contact with her, even Cicero, who hated her, the Roman senator and writer, said that, uh, boy, she, everybody fell under her spell. She spoke nine languages, including Greek, Hebrew, Parthian, Median, Ethiopian, Arab, Aramaic, all the countries in her area, and was the first of the Egyptian rulers in the Ptolemaic line to speak Egyptian. So she did all the celebrations and temples in Egyptian which they had not been doing before. She assumed the throne when she was 17 years old, had to marry her brother, Ptolemy the 13th, who was 10. We don't think the marriage was consummated. Her advisors soon found her uncontrollable, and that led to a civil war. So she fled to raise an army. And then came Caesar, after his uh, winning the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC, chasing Pompey. And he chases him to Egypt. I won't get into the details of how they killed Pompey in Egypt, given a bunch of bad choices. So Cleopatra steals in to see him, not wrapped in an oriental rug like all the movies want to show, probably a laundry bag, but she pops out. He's 52, she's 21. She is wealthy, she is alluring, she's made up to be beautiful, and she's the ruler, uh, one of the potential rulers of the wealthiest country in the world. And Caesar was both an egotist, a philanderer of the first level, and he needed money. Cassius Dio says she made herself up. She was attractive, regal, and distressed. Perfect for her. Perfect for him. In the Siege of Alexandria, they had been held up, tw held out against 26,000 Greeks who uh, tried to, to take, take uh, Alexand uh, Alexander, Caesar and Cleopatra out. They were actually holding Ptolemy the 13th at the time. 
but he, the Alexandrians requested that he be sent out. Why? Sister Arsinoe was back. She had killed, had the general killed, and her and her chief eunuch were running the army now. And the Alexandrians wanted Ptolemy back. So he, Caesar said, go right ahead, have him. Defeated that battle, Ptolemy III is dead. She's then forced to marry. Uh, that, Caesar stays some, some months in Egypt. They take their famous trip down the Nile. He finally has to get back to business. He leaves Cleopatra pregnant. She later on delivers Ptolemy the 15th Caesarian. But at Caesar's direction, she also marries her brother, Ptolemy the 14th, who's even younger. Caesar's killed in Rome. Why? One of the reasons I'll say is because he was sleeping with, he had seduced almost all the senators' wives. Didn't help. You can all read about the different ideological and political issues. I think that was a key. But the, uh, one of the things Shakespeare doesn't mention, and it, although it is shown in the movie Cleopatra, Cleopatra had gone to take her son, Caesarion, to show him deceased and to renew the alliance with Rome. She departs after, after he's uh, killed, and somewhere along the way, Ptolemy the 14th manages to die, probably by poison, thanks to Cleopatra. She was, she did what had to be done. Antony is now sent out to the east as part of the triumvirate. He invites and summons Cleopatra, and as you saw in the movie, again, that's a description right out of Plutarch. The big golden galley, the lovely uh, ladies all over it, the at, incense wafting, all part of the scene. Again, it's a round of feast, and Cleopatra realizes she needs to get Antony on her side. She lowers her tone, it's crude humor, and later she supports him, they become allies. She supports him in the east with money, troops, ships, and bears him three children, two twins, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, and Ptolemy Philadelphus. Lots is made later, and by Roman propagandists at the time, about Cleopatra being one of those eastern seducers. Modern scholarship is saying she may have been celibate, except when she was with Caesar and Antony. There is no statements by anybody of anybody that she ever went with, and apparently the Ptolemaic women were very strict and loyal. The men were another thing, but the women were very strict and loyal. So that may have been her only two partners. One of the things Anthony does is he has a big ceremony in, Ath in Alexandria and gives parts of the Roman Empire to her children. This kind of gets him in trouble back in Rome. And then they dig out his will and says, geez, when I die, I don't want to be buried in Rome. Send me to Cleopatra in Alexandria. I'll be set up in Alexandria. In addition, after a military battle and a, a victory, they had what sure looked like a Roman triumph, the typical parade in Alexandria. And what do the Romans think of that? Roman generals are only supposed to triumph in Rome. So there's lots of excuses. Octavian, Julius Caesar's heir, who actually took the name smartly. Julius Caesar inherited the name as well as his troops and money and lands and political followers and had been in alliance with Antony and, and one other general, Lepidus. It's now broken apart and now we're going down to a final contest. Don't want to declare war on a fellow Roman though, so he declares war on Cleopatra. Why Cleopatra? She's that evil seducer. She's a woman. You shouldn't have women in charge. She's Eastern. She's Greek. She's Asian. She's bad. And lots of propaganda, lots of letters. They whip the Roman populace up into a froth, and they go to war. 
Antony's not that great a general. He's a wonderful leader. He's good with men, but he gets surrounded. The Battle of Octium, unlike the movie Cleopatra, was actually a, not an even fight at all. Antony was uh, in bad shape. He had a huge army recruited from all over the East, 19 legions. Octavian had almost as many. But in this low ground here at Octium, which is over in by the Albanian Greek border, the, uh, this area is all swampy and marshy. And there's no good fresh water. So the troops are low on water. These islands down here had been seized by uh, uh, Octavian, Julius Caesar's uh, fleets, and so they were cut off from supplies. So now they're not getting food, they're not getting water, they're digging up tubers to eat, and they are finishing off. So let's escape. Take the, the treasury, take the ships, and they built big ships. Unlike all naval battles which were under oar, they took their, their masts and sails along. It was obvious they were going to flee. As soon as there was a breakout, a hole, the uh, Egyptian part of the fleet, which was in reserve, broke out. Antony got in a boat and followed. Only about 20 ships went with him. The fleet was gone. Told the army to march east and get back to me. And instead, they surrendered. So now Octavian has all the troops. They get back, and now things are pretty bad. They actually had about a year together to, before Octavian could get down to Egypt. And what did they do? Well, back during the good old days when they were having kids in Alexandria and ruling the East, they had a society of inimitable livers. And they had their generals. I mentioned the fish dance. The fish dance is performed by stripping yourself naked, painting yourself blue, and putting a fish tail on, and doing a lewd dance. Imagine a Roman general doing this. Not Antony, but some of his generals did this. Uh, it was bad. But the, uh, they reconvened that club, that Society of Inimitable Livers, but renamed it the Dyers Together. I mentioned the Timonium. Alexander built that house and sat out there for months just He'd thrown his life away. He'd thrown the world power away. He'd blown it. And now they were just waiting when Octavian was going to come. Again, Cleopatra, not necessarily the nicest person, tested, this is attested in sources, tested out poisons on slaves. Let's see what works. I want to die quick and painlessly. She found out that wasn't an option. The, the poisons that work quick threw people into convulsions and looked very painful. The poisons of the work that weren't painful took a long time. So she eventually settled on the asp because it took a bit, but it would basically just put you to sleep, made you lethargic, and you went out fairly easily. She then, as you saw in that scene, Anthony kills himself, then she kills herself, and the dynasty is over. Let's talk about her legacy for a bit. She's affected Western culture ever since. Okay, Rome was the ultimate patriarchal society. We get the word from them. Okay, only men held political positions. Only men ran things. If you were the man head of a family, you had all legal rights, including you could kill any member of your family. You had that legal right. Okay. In ancient Egypt, in ancient Greece, women could rule. They could, had to have a husband, okay, could be a puppet, but they were powerful. They could be regents, they could be queens, they could rule, they could have impact. This horrified the Romans. So they propagandized her for a long time, against her for a long time. And it came down through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and on past that Cleopatra was manipulative. Look at, she seduced Roman generals away from the right path. And so we've got that even into modern times. So what do you see? Sarah Bernhardt performs her on stage always as a temptress, always as a seductress, always as a manipulator, and always kind of evil. I love the ads from the, the, some periods, the Art Deco things, 
citrus fruits even. I guess the connection is the Egyptians made beer and Cleopatra was Egyptian. I Theta Bera played her in a famous 1917 movie. Absolutely wonderful. Um, she laid her on the Hay, it was 1917. In 1930, the Hayes Committee branded it obscene and ordered it withdrawn from <laughs> circulation. Some of the outfits were a little risque. If you search on YouTube, there's actually a five second clip of the movie. The others have all been destroyed. The last two prints were in the, um, a museum in New York, and I forget some university, and they were actually, you know, they caught fire basically, not intentionally. So they do not exist other than out these stills, that five second clip, and there's one interview of her, she has a very educated sounding voice, of a, a clip, an audio clip of her being interviewed by Groucho Marx. Claudette Colbert, that was one of my favorite, she did a good job. Vivian Lee, not so good, but the battle scenes were interesting, very accurate, and there was a good scene of, uh, um, oh, I forgot his name, Claude Rains, um, actually swimming across the harbor when the Egyptians took the pharaohs and he had to escape, which was in Plutarch. Elizabeth Taylor, the standard by which most Cleopatras will probably always be measured. Monica Bellucci, I have this, I haven't watched it yet, but the costumes are outrageous. And the milk bath, which, oh, by the way, nobody had milk baths at the time. That was, that was a later affectation. And this is a comic book series in Europe, Asterisk and Obelisk. They turned it into a movie. And coming next year, Angelina Jolie plays Cleopatra. There are, uh, the African American community is actually against this. I think an African American woman should play the part. However, there is no evidence that we don't know anything about her complexion except for one statement by one of the authors who said she had a milk white breast. Other than that, that could have just been a, a stereotype. Um, other than that, we don't factually know who her mother is. We think it was Cleopatra V. But the only reason is because she died in the same year Cleopatra VII was born. So we think maybe she died in childbirth or shortly thereafter, in which case that makes her full-blooded, incestually begatted uh, Macedonian. However, we don't know that for a fact. Could have been one of the concubines. Could have been. And they could have been of any race. So is she more likely Macedonian, full-blooded Macedonian than part Egyptian? Yeah. Or then part African? Yeah. But we don't know. So why do we care about the Ptolemies? 300 years worth. Longest reign, Greek culture, Alexandria, everything, not everything, lots of things we touch on a daily basis have their origins back in that library and museum. And there are a lot more than just Cleopatra, even though that's what we kind of stick on. Questions? <laughs> yes? Cassius Dio and uh, Lucian, as I mentioned. Um, the question was, what are the other sources other than Plutarch? Charlotte, did you have the next question or you want to intervene? Oh, okay. Hang on. <laughs> um, and Deodorus. And Cicero, some of his letters. Oh, yeah, that's why she has such a bad reputation. Yeah, essentially all Roman. We know her through the Romans. True. Interestingly, like I said, Shakespeare doesn't have her in Julius Caesar, which makes no sense at all, but he, she's all over Antony and Cleopatra, obviously. Charlotte. What a great question. I was going to actually try to plant that, but I didn't have to. Um, he actually almost got away, a uh, Caesarian. 
He, unlike the movie where she sees his signet ring on Octavian's hand, that didn't happen. He gets away. He's down in, near Berenike. His tutor turns and says, ah, I've been told that Octavian wants to crown you king of Egypt. Oh, OK, I'm going back. He goes back, and Octavian told by, he asked one of his advisors, what should I do with this kid? And the advisor, famous saying, one Caesar is well enough. OK, we don't need more than one Caesar. So he kills him. The other children, the, the two boys, disappear. We don't know. We don't know. It's presumed Augustus Octavian had them killed. The daughter, interestingly, mar got married off to King Juba of Mauritania, which is modern Algeria and Morocco. OK? And had a son, Ptolemy, who ruled and was a cousin later on to Caligula, who had him killed. <laughs> Keeping the family tradition alive. Um, however, it is, some authors aren't sure. Others are saying there was also a daughter from Ptolemy and his wife. And she married off, and the family ended up in Syria through the kings and priests down here, which led to a series of third century emperors. So there may have been Cleopatra's blood down there, but there's a big, we're not, that's kind of hazy. In addition, Zenobia, the queen of Palmyra, who took over half the Roman Empire in the 200s, uh, also claimed descent from Alexandria, and it was kind of implied Cleopatra. That was probably propagandistic, but, but she did claim it. But that's what happened to her three kids. Can't recapture that whole question, but uh, the, the Ptolemies definitely saw themselves as Greek. Well, Macedonia, okay, definitely. In fact, Alexandria, according to them, was not part of Egypt. It was referred to as Alexandria by Egypt. The two entities. They were king, and they were kings of the Ptolemaic Empire, which was. Egypt and Cyrenica and Palestine and those Greek islands and the coast of Asia Minor and Cyprus. And so, no, they did not see themselves as Egyptian. No, and that's, I think, why they never bothered to learn. They did the Pharaoh thing, the crown, and, you know, did and the, the inscriptions, and they all had Egyptian, you know, uh, reign names and things like that. I think that was very pro forma. Uh, the bit about the law against intermarriage is very telling. Okay, I, I, I think that she was really the first one that started trying to bring them together. Had Cleopatra lived, I think that not only would you have seen a further melding of the Greek and Egyptian population, interestingly, one of the things I ran across, almost no Egyptian words make their way into Greek. Okay, so they really didn't merge very much. But you would have also have seen, had Mark Antony won that last campaign, you would have seen a merging of the East more with the West, okay? And so you would have seen them not being subjects of Rome so much, but all of the East, Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, being more of a partnership, and which happened later on, but it would have happened much earlier. Good question. Yes, sir. We have no clue what happened to Cleopatra. None. None. After that scene, we presume she was mummified and buried. Zawi Hawass on TV shows lately, before he got fired, was claiming to be looking for her tomb near Ale just that, that area, the spit of land west of Alexandria. But the ancient sources do not say what happened to her after that. We know more about Alexander's body for the next couple hundred years than what happened to Cleopatra. We don't know, we don't know what happened to him or Mark Antony. 
Now, the Romans used to burn their dead at the time, so it's presumed he was cremated. We just never heard what happened to her. Yeah, Jim. Oh, really? Cool. Uh, for the recording, Jim said that this month's scribe palette has an article on her children. So looking forward to that. Last question? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs>